I want to talk about these common ways or these underlying things that are going on when we're procrastinating. Because even if you use all the best tools, if these things aren't hmm, addressed or worked with, they're a little different. So there's no one right way to summarize what we do with them. But if these are things that we've not taken a look at, a lot of times then we might not be able to get ourselves to do some things. Hi, I'm Jen Barnes, and you're about to experience how to ditch the old ways of doing things, embrace your neurodivergence, learn tips and tricks to function optimally, and love yourself, neurodivergence and all. Welcome to the Self-Loved Woman Podcast. Hey, it's Jen. I'm so glad you're here for another episode of the Self-Loved Woman Way, a podcast specifically for my fellow ADHD women entrepreneurs. So today we're going to talk about something common that women with ADHD struggle with, and it's procrastination. But I want to take a little bit different angle on this because what I've noticed is, you know, when people struggle to procrastinate, they're like trying all these skills and strategies and like, oh, if I can just get myself to do it and all these, you know, tips and tricks and things like that. And it just doesn't work because here's the thing. If it only took the right strategy, tips, and tricks, then like we'd be crushing it by now, (laughs) right? So I find that there are five deeper things that tend to be the culprit. At least one of them is, if not multiple of these, when we're struggling to get ourselves to do stuff. So we're going to unpack this today. Because I really want to help you be able to do the things you need to do and especially do the important things you need to do for your business, right? One way that we procrastinate or hide from doing stuff is we will take ineffective action. So we'll focus on doing all kinds of stuff like, oh, I'm going to update my website, even though like our website is good enough and we don't have any clients coming in the door. What we really need to focus on is things that bring clients in the door, right? And yes, I know new clients see your website, but a lot of times our website isn't what brings people in. Gone are the days where you can put a website on the internet and just expect people to be like, oh, look at that website. I should work with her, right? Like there's a lot more to it now because there's just, you know, the internet is so huge and flooded with so many experts or people who call themselves experts. So we need to find ways to stand out and also help people get to know us, like who we are, what we offer, how we can help and understand our heart see that we're in the right place, that we're not one of those people who's going to scam them or charge them a bunch of money and give them fluff, right? So anyway, that was a little bit of an aside as to one of the ways that we hide from getting stuff done, which is ineffective action, right? So if you catch yourself doing any of these things, hiding from getting stuff done, I just want to say like you come by it honestly. With ADHD, task completion is and even task commencement, (laughs) starting tasks is tough. And there's lots of reasons why this is, right? Our executive functioning is different in our ADHD brain. So the way we approach things is different. Also, we have an interest-based nervous system. So we tend to be able to focus on things that are interesting to us, whereas neurotypical folks can you know, get themselves to do something because it's important or because someone else thinks it's important or because there's a big consequence if they don't or a big reward if they do. And that while those things can sometimes work for us ADHD ladies, uh, <laughs> a lot of times those things are ineffective. I want to talk about the interest-based nervous system another time because it's a really important topic, like working with it. But I want to talk about these common ways or these underlying things that are going on when we're procrastinating, because even if you use all the best tools, if these things aren't hmm, addressed or worked with, they're a little different. So there's no one right way to summarize what we do with them. But if these are things that we've not taken a look at, a lot of times then we might not be able to get ourselves to do something. So let's dig right in. The first one, and this is going to be pretty big, Have you ever noticed like sometimes you just can't get yourself to do a task, but then maybe you step back and you're like, God, why is this so hard? And you realize it's just not aligned with your values, right? Something that is really important work for all people, but especially ADHD women entrepreneurs is to get super clear on our core values, especially inside of our business. This is essential 
because this can be kind of like an anchor from which we can float around, right? In our <laughs> the way that we float around in the world and in our business. And our core values, they'll help kind of guide us into what really aligns with our mission and our vision, right? So my top three core values are health and wellness, learning and education and growth, and then wholeheartedness, which is really kind of a cheat one, right? Like when I had to break this down a a while ago, come up with three, wholeheartedness includes like compassion and curiosity and gratitude and all that fun stuff. So that's kind of my cheat way of getting extra in there. (laughs) But those are my top values. And the other day I I had a task. I can't remember what it was now. And I was like, oh yeah, I totally need to do this. I need to get this done. And I was like, well, is that really like advancing health and wellness. Like it wasn't, it was like malaligned with that value of mine. And I'm like, I just can't stand by that. No wonder I'm having a hard time getting this task done. And so I dropped it. I was like, this is not something that aligns with my values. This is not something that aligns. And even though it seemed like a good idea, there just didn't seem be seem to be enough room to tweak it to stay in alignment with those values. So one way you can check and see, like if you're not able to get yourself to do something, see if it aligns, like if it checks out with your core values. And if you're not sure how to do that, there's all kinds of ways. I'm sure you could search online. We do this in my program too, but there's probably ways online you can search to help identify your core values. I know Brene Brown on her Dare to Leave hub has an activity for this too. So If you're not up for a whole program right now, those are some ways to get clear on your values, but then they can kind of be a guiding light in some ways so that if you're not able to do something, you can be like, is this in alignment? And if it's not, perhaps shifting. The next thing that can get in the way of us doing stuff is when the task is not in alignment with our deepest why. And this is a close cousin to our values. But our deepest why is more related to why you are doing this business, right? Why you want to have the business that you have. So for me, I want to have a business and have a business that helps ADHD women entrepreneurs. And I want to do this because I truly believe when we free ADHD women from living the neurotypical life and having to work in full-time jobs that aren't a fit for them towards entrepreneurship where they're able to, you know, work the way they want on the schedule they want and just do things the way their brain works. Then those women are able to contribute in ways way beyond what they could do any other way, but also enjoy their life. So that all of your free time isn't going to, you know, functioning with ADHD, right? Or crashing from being tired from functioning with ADHD. So that's a big piece of my deepest why. But when we have that, you know, Melinda French Gates writes in her book, The Moment of Lift, that when we uplift women, we uplift communities and nations and the world. And so that's my deeper vision. So that's one piece of how I contribute to the world. There are other reasons why I do my business. I certainly do my business to make money. (laughs) If you're in a business and you're not doing it to make money, you're going to have a problem. (laughs) It's just plain and simple because we do need to make money. But I do it to make money in a way that also allows me to function with my ADHD in a way where I still have time, energy, and money to do things that I enjoy more often. And then when we're doing our deepest why, we can ask, when we have that, what do we have? right? When I'm able to work that way, what do I have? And deep down what it comes to is I have a life where I'm able to learn and grow, which is what I think our life is for, as well as connect with others and just enjoy the beauty that surrounds us and grow from the hard stuff, right? So, I mean, it takes a few steps to get there, but when we're clear on our deepest why, if we're struggling to get ourselves to do something, sometimes it could be because like a task just doesn't like align with that. 
right? I was having a hard time. I think I talked about this in a recent podcast too. It was a couple of weeks ago now. I was having a hard time getting myself to update my sales page because I'm launching my program again and there's going to be some added pieces to it that focus more on the business aspects of ADHD women entrepreneurs. My my beta program focused primarily on ADHD women working with ADHD with a little bit around business. And so now I'm adding a bunch of extra pieces and some one-to-one coaching. At any rate, long story short, so I was like, oh, I need to do another sales page and you know whatever. But my intention is only to bring on smaller groups of women at the same time as we grow the program so I can really focus on people getting results. But a sales page is for dozens, hundreds of people to look at and understand what I'm doing. So that doesn't align with my deepest why right now, because that's not what's going to bring people to me the way I'm going about it so I can help them and then thus, you know, achieve my deepest why. So sometimes when you have something that you're like, I don't know why I can't get myself to do this, maybe check it out and be like, okay, well, why am I doing this business? What is my intention? What am I hoping to do? What does that look like? What do I get if that happens? And really breaking it down to see. And then checking out, like, does this task fit into that in any way whatsoever? And if you're like, not really, then that could be a reason why you're having a hard time doing the task. And then you get to decide, like, is this a task that can be deleted or does it still need to be done and you just need to delegate it, right? Like I always talk about bookkeeping, which is funny because I took all the possible accounting classes in high school and I started out as an accounting major in college. So I had my econ classes, my business law, all that, and a bunch of accounting classes. And it's not that, you know, I didn't used to love accounting. I really did. It's just that now there's things I love more. (laughs) And so like doing my bookkeeping, which I realize accounting is more advanced, but like doing the bookkeeping side of my business drains me. (laughs) But that does align with my deepest why. Because if I'm not tracking the money I'm making, if I'm not being intentional with my expenses and with my revenue, then I'm not going to align with my deepest why. I'm not going to make the money I need to make to help the women I want to help and to have the life I want to have, right? That doesn't mean I'm the right person to do that task, right? That's a task that I delegate. So knowing your deepest why can really help you figure out, like, is this task something that really aligns with that? Because if you're having a hard time doing it, it might be that it doesn't. And then it might be time to make a shift. All right. So this next one, I try to come up with like a fancy name for or like a cool acronym. And then I was just like, that just doesn't matter, right? It's just like, whatever. Like sometimes the fancy acronym just doesn't matter. So this next one is, have you set yourself up for success? And this has a lot of pieces to it, right? One, are you doing things to take care of yourself, at least at the bare minimum? For someone with ADHD, this is going to be more than someone who doesn't have ADHD because we need at least eight hours of sleep to function. Our brains do not function well without solid sleep. They just don't. You know, ask any new mom who has ADHD and it's like their life is total chaos when they're used to maybe having some level of, you know, some semblance of organization in their life. It's just everything's all over the place. It kind of becomes a crapshoot. At least that's what I've heard from my my ADHD moms. (laughs) And so like new moms. Usually I hear that they settle eventually over time there. So, you know, if they know how to work with it. So, but we know that we need sleep. We know we need solid sleep. That's like step one. We also know we need to eat and we eat, need to eat nutritionally. Eating a bunch of sugar is actually going to make our attention so much worse. And it's going to cause a dopamine spike. And the problem with dopamine spikes is that when we have a dopamine spike, it actually then we drop down below our baseline and our baseline dopamine lowers. This comes from Dr. Andrew Huberman in the Huberman Lab podcast, where he talks way more in depth about this on his podcast on dopamine. And so when we are doing these dopamine hits like sugar or whatever, 
like a bunch of sugar, then we're going to have a harder time sustaining our dopamine level. And we know that dopamine is closely tied with being able to get ourselves to focus as well as being able to get ourselves to do stuff. And so we want to make sure that we're eating nutritionally and, you know, not just shoving sweets in our mouth or whatever else might be that dopamine hit for you. Other ways that we need to prep with ADHD is getting movement in our bodies. And you can fight me on this and be like, Jen, I don't have time to exercise. That's fine. I'm not even saying you have to exercise. Movement. We need some kind of movement in our body to get some of that energy out, especially if you tend towards physical hyperactivity. But even if you have the hyperactivity in your head, moving your body is going to help. It also helps with that base level dopamine, right? So eating nutritiously, getting good sleep and enough of it, exercising, those things are going to set yourself up for success. One more. You're not going to like this. No one likes this one. This one people fight even more than the E word exercise, right? Mindfulness. (laughs) You've heard me talk about it probably a gazillion times in this podcast and If you practice mindfulness meditation consistently over time, you will improve your ability to focus. Plain and simple. The data is clear. And if you're, if you are like, nope, I'm not going to do it. Totally. You don't have to do it. If you want to focus better, I highly recommend it, right? That would help set you up for success, right? If you're like, I got no problem focusing. Great. No problem. No need for mindfulness for you. Although I got to say there's other benefits. So (laughs) You know, but I get it. You know, everyone talks about mindfulness. It's mindfulness this and mindfulness that. And I get it. It feels like it's pushed, but there are ways that with ADHD, we can do mindfulness that works for our ADHD brain. And I've talked about that in other episodes. I also have a ADHD mindfulness download. You know what? I'll write myself a note to make sure that I share that in the show notes, ADHD mindfulness, in case you're finally convinced that this might be something you want to try. Um, <laughs> we'll give you an opportunity to practice. They're short and sweet and simple and kind of open the door to mindfulness, addressing people's biggest concern, which is that they're supposed to quiet their thoughts, which is like not something our brain is ever going to do, ADHD or not, just so you know. So, but excuse me, those things are things that are going to set you up for success with your ADHD. Another thing is paying attention to when you are choosing to do certain tasks. We talked with Sally Crew in another podcast episode on noticing the fluctuations of your energy and when in your day is an optimal time to do different kinds of tasks. There are windows of time where I am strongest with being able to record a podcast or at least identify what I want to talk about in the podcast. That same time is like when I'm writing. Those are good times for me to like write a blog post or something like that to write content because that time of day, my energy is aligned with that. For me, it's like between 10 and 12 noon, right? For some people, it's later in the day. And as we talked about with Sally, we also have times in our day when maybe some of those piddly little tasks here and there are better fit us, you know, better fit for our energy. And so another way that that we struggle to get stuff done is because maybe we're trying to do a task that is not placed at the time of day or a day of the week that's optimal for us. I still have a private practice and I have some seven client days. I can't create content on a seven client day. And You might be like, oh, I can't. I mean, that's a limiting belief. Maybe, but I will tell you, after seeing seven clients, my brain is pretty shot (laughs) because I'm a trauma therapist and I need a break. And so, yeah, maybe I could get up earlier and do it before, but then I'm getting up at a time that's earlier than my usual time, which is also hard because I'm not super awake that time of morning right? And so just paying attention to the ebb and flow of your energy and when, you know, what days of the week tend to be best. It doesn't mean that you can't ever do a task at a time when it's not optimal. It just means it's not optimal. So it might take you longer. It might be harder to drag yourself to do it. Another piece that can be off with getting ourselves to do stuff around setting the stage or setting yourself up for success is your environment. We are deeply impacted by sensory input. Most of us neurodivergent folks, we feel things deeply. We hear sounds intensely. Sometimes some of us do. 
we take in a lot of sensory stimuli. We see more than most people see. We hear more than most people hear. It's not that we can't attend to anything. It's just that we have so much sensory input that it can be hard to ascertain where to place our focus, right? And so we can help ourselves out. We can set ourselves up for success with this. We can limit the things in our visual space, right? And an example of that, I'm just going to give one. I'm not going to unpack all of this, right? Like that's more for like the people I work with one-to-one, but you get an idea, right? If you want, you could declutter your space. So before I'm going to do some writing or podcasting or meeting with clients, I will declutter my space. And a lot of times for me, that just means moving it out of eyesight. Also spreading out, being able to spread out is really important. Having visual things in your visual field that are appealing to you. So I have my window open right behind the screen and I can see outside where there's trees and um, birds and in the summertime, bees and <laughs> wasps and unfortunately box elder bugs, but there's, that's a whole nother <laughs> rabbit hole there. But anyway, so it's setting up your visual space is important center, setting up your, the sounds in your space, whether you need headphones that are completely noise canceling, or maybe loops, earbuds that are um, earplugs that can be beneficial, different kinds of music or brown noise or pink noise. So we want to set the stage sound-wise for ourselves as well, right? And then other physical sensation and touch. I often keep a blanket in my lap. Yes, because I'm cold, but also it's kind of grounding, right? It's something soft and yet it's got some weight to it, so it can feel grounding. So, you know, having physical sensations and then also eliminating sensations that are going to be distracting. There are some days I can do my bracelets and there are other days where I'm like, oh no, that is going to drive me crazy today. I It will put me over the edge. I'm not going to be able to focus because I'm going to be distracted with the bracelet touching my skin. Or if there's a tag that's weird or my socks are weird, right? And so those are things that you want to attend to set the stage because if those things are off, it's going to make it harder for you to like focus on what you need to get yourself to do. You're going to struggle with being motivated because you feel uncomfortable. So we want to set the stage for ourselves to be able to focus. And then that will help our motivation too. It's just making it easier on ourselves. So if you're having a hard time getting yourself to do something, like we've talked about, check and see, is it in alignment with your values? Is it in alignment with your deepest why? And are you setting the stage for success in your environment, in your body? So there's a couple more things that I want us to talk about. And one is asking yourself, is this something that only you can do? And if only you can do it, is this something that really needs to be done? And does it really need to be done now? Like, does it need to be done today, this hour, or even this week, this month, or at all? A lot of times we end up with all these tasks on our to-do list because they sound like good ideas in the moment. Or we're like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. That sounds great. I'll do that. Oh, yeah. But sometimes we're just throwing spaghetti at the wall and <laughs> we don't think through it, right? Because our ADHD brains are like, oh, yeah that, yeah, that sounds good. I should do that. Oh, yeah, wait, that too. And so if we're having a hard time getting ourselves to do stuff, sometimes we have too many tasks on our plate and that that can be helpful to go through our tasks and figure out like, what here can be deleted? Like what really doesn't need to be done? I can't remember what I deleted off my task list. Oh, it was just this morning I deleted something. I'm like, this has been on there for a long time. I haven't done it yet. It's not going to happen. It's really not aligned with what I'm doing anymore. So took it off, right? Felt so freeing. Don't even remember what it was. That's how little I think about it now, right? It's like, awesome. Cleared up some brain space and some space on my to-do list, right? So it's important to consider those things on your task list, especially if you're having a hard time feeling motivated to do them. Do they need to be done at all? And then the next question is, do they need to be done by you? Like, are you the only person who can do them or do they need to be delegated? I had the worst time with my billing for my private practice. So, you know, and I have an electronic health record that does it. But for me, it was following up with insurance companies. It was like the bane of my existence. And so when I had an opportunity to hire a biller through my electronic health record, I was like, oh, hell yes, because I can do it, but it makes me crabby. And it was just like, oh my gosh, it would take me hours and hours. It just wasn't worth it to me. 
So sometimes there are things that you might be able to do, but that are better delegated, especially if you are the owner of this business. Because I can hire an assistant and I have an assistant who does things like editing my podcast, right? I can hire an assistant to update my website or, up, you know, create a new landing page or whatever. I cannot hire an assistant to do my podcast. <laughs> I mean, I could, it just wouldn't be me anymore. I cannot hire an assistant to serve the people in my program who have paid me to serve them. I cannot hire an assistant to come up with ideas unique from my brain to help people. So there are some things that in your business only you can do. And so if you're spending your time on those things that you can delegate, then you're not going to have the time or energy or resources to be able to do the things that only you can do. And so is this something only you can do is a really important question. And you might be thinking, oh my gosh, Jen, but I can't hire an assistant yet. And We've talked about this before. I get it. Like sometimes it feels too soon. Sometimes we don't feel like we have the money and there's definitely solutions to that. And it's important that you really think about it. Like how else can you, how can you delegate this task? Sometimes I'll delegate tasks to chat GPT, <laughs> right? Like what was it the other day? It was like, oh yeah, I was creating a list of values for my my program so that they could do the values activity that I like to do. But in the past, I've always used Brene Brown's list. Well, this is now with clients. And now this is a, a program that people pay for. So I, you know, it would be a violation of copyright if I used hers. So I'm like, how do I sit and come up with a bunch of values that are awesome without copying her list? So I went into ChatGPT and I said, hey, give me a list of 120 values. And it did. It was awesome. That list would have taken me easily an hour and a half because my brain would have been like, well, what about this? And what about this? And I would have been doing research. It actually probably would have taken me like three hours because I would have done all these research rabbit holes and like, what are the top values? And the thing is, it didn't matter. So there are things that we can delegate and simplify that sometimes we're struggling to get ourselves to do because we, we're not seeing that's what actually needs to be done. All right. So last but not least... And this is the tough one because this is the one that requires way deeper work. But one of the things that I see interfering a lot with people getting themselves to do stuff is the big feelings. <laughs> Us women with ADHD come by it honestly. We're highly sensitive beings. We're very attuned to our environment and our own inner experience. We feel our feelings deeply. We feel them big. And a lot of times, some of those feelings involve fear of failure, fear of success, fear of judgment, criticism, and rejection, you know, the latter of which were <laughs> those last three, which we're all very familiar with having ADHD, right? Some degree of it. Sometimes people fear like people seeing you, right? Like being seen, which of course, you know, then often the underlying fear there is that people would judge you or criticize you or reject you. But whatever it is, a lot of times when we're really stuck and we've tried all these other things I talked about, we've checked in on them, there can be deeper underlying feelings of fear holding us back. And it's tough because that requires some deeper work. It requires us to really lean in and get curious about the parts of us that are feeling afraid. The parts of us, and really, ultimately, there is a part of you protecting you from being harmed by what this other part is afraid of. So a part of you is afraid that bad things are going to happen. And maybe that is the part who's protecting you by making you not do the thing you need to do so that then these other things don't happen, right? But sometimes that protector sees a part who's scared and comes in and is like, yeah, we're not doing that. We're not going to start a podcast because even though that would bring in more audience, I mean, geez, then people would see us and they might judge us and reject us and that would hurt and we wouldn't be able to handle it. And so then, the, you know, there's this protector that comes in and just doesn't let you even start. So there's deeper work there for sure of working with this inner, inner turmoil or struggle or deep feelings that we come by honestly. I mean, I think most people struggle with fear of criticism, fear of judgment. I think that it is particularly deep for neurodivergent folks because we have experienced so much criticism and judgment over the course of our lifetimes. And being seen can be really scary. 
success can be scary because it means now you have more work <laughs> because you have clients to to serve on top of continuing to people bring people into the business. But failure can also be hard because no one wants to feel like they failed, right? And especially if we haven't adopted that growth mindset that I talk about where we see things not working out as opportunities for learning, we see it as failure, then that's rough. So if you're noticing these things, there's some deeper work here to sit with these parts of you and get curious about them and hold space for them and validate those experiences, really understanding so that you can work with these feelings and eventually be able to do the thing you need to do. So we covered a lot today. I feel like I went fast. Maybe I didn't go fast. I don't know. You can tell me. (laughs) I hope you found something helpful within these main ways that are keeping you from getting stuff done when the strategies and tools aren't working. Because a lot of times this is it, right? It's this deeper stuff that we need to address. If you're not following yet, please make sure that you follow or subscribe depending where you get your podcasts. And I would love it if you comment and share. I really like interacting with people. I like hearing what's resonating and what's not because I want to help. And the more I hear from you, the more I know like what those challenges are and what the things are that that you want me to talk about? What resonates? What doesn't make sense? What are you like, well, you said this thing and then you didn't finish it and it sounded like, I don't know, a bunch of gobbledygook, right? Which I do have ADHD. So sometimes I might start something (laughs) and get distracted. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. So feel free to point that out if you noticed that and you wanted more info on the thing that I, on the the rope that I dropped. (laughs) But be sure to share and comment and follow. All right. I'll see you next time. Take care.